Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here. It's Monday, January 22nd. Yes, I had to look. Start of another week. We got a full one ahead of us. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit the subscribe button, like the video, share it with your friends. And if you want notifications, you can hit that little bell. It'll let you know every time I upload new content. Just like today, I uploaded Donna Adelson's new court appearance. She was in for a status conference this morning. Very brief, but you get to see her on Zoom. So check it out. Music fact of the day. The Beatles song Penny Lane was written about Paul McCartney and John Lennon's hometown of Liverpool. They wrote the song to show how much Liverpool meant to them. And it was still in their hearts despite being super famous and touring all over the world. I don't know why I thought that was about a woman, but I guess you learn something new every day. Donna was back in court through Zoom today. They talk about discovery in the beginning and make sure that things are being received. The state said that process is ongoing. The judge asked if they would need another case management in a few months or start talking about a trial date. Defense attorney Rashbaum thinks that they'll need another hearing not a few months out, and they'll have a better idea then about a trial date. They bring Donna in, and the judge talks to Donna about conflicts with counsel. So he swears her in and asks her some questions. He asked if she understands she has the right to conflict-free representation. She says yes, she understands. The judge says that Rashbaum has prior responsibilities related to the representation of Charlie, and it could potentially in some way affect his representation of her. The judge says to waive any conflict, she has the right to retain independent counsel on this matter. Ultimately, she waived any conflicts of the prior representation of Charlie and what may come from that. Another thing that he explained to her is the possibility that her attorney could become a witness in the case. He explains that an attorney can't be an advocate and a witness in the same case. Donna understands this. So if the state were to call defense attorney Rashbaum for any reason, that could affect his defense of her. She understands. That was pretty much it. Her next case management hearing is set for February 12th at 2.30 p.m. Defense attorney Rashbaum says at the moment there will not be a waiver of a speedy trial. He doesn't think it'll be an issue. They're working on the state to set a trial date. Seems like she's ready to go, even though he didn't waive that right today. We know that Donna wants to get this over with. Donna looks much better than I thought she would. A lot of times when people are first timers into the jail system, they don't do very well. They lose a lot of weight. To me, I think she kind of looks healthier than when she went in. You know, maybe like Charlie, all this running for all these years, looking over your shoulder and living in fear of the inevitable, which for them was to be arrested. Maybe it's a relief in some way that they don't have that worry. I'm sure they're not relieved about where they are. You can tell she's going to be very, very much involved with her defense. So we will see her again February 12th. We left off talking about these bumps and the fallout afterwards. So how many bumps have we had up to where we are now in our coverage of this case? April 19th was that very first bump with Donna outside of her condo. Then again, on April 25th, that's when the letter was mailed to the condo. Now we have a third bump that's going to get everybody talking again. And I think these calls you'll see, there's a little bit more urgency, a little bit more panic especially among Charlie and Katie. This happened on April 28th, where the undercover agent called the Adelson Institute and spoke with Erica, who is the office manager. After that happens, Donna calls Charlie and says that Erica, who works in their office, called her and said she normally wouldn't bother her with this, but Erica didn't know if this was a sales call or what, but somebody called the dentist office that morning and said his name was Sammy. He said he gave you very important papers last week and he hasn't heard from you and he wants you to call him back and here's the number. Donna wants Charlie to verify that was the same number that she had told him about that was written on that paper with the first bump. Donna says she's not going to call the number. Erica told her, you know, if this turns out to be a sales call, just hit star 67 before you call the number. Then they won't know what number you're calling from. She said she would write that down. And then she asked Charlie, what's his suggestion? Charlie asked if that's the same phone number that Donna gave him. And Donna just doesn't know because he kept the number. He asked the number that was given that morning and she recites it. Charlie says the odd thing is that the same number that was called, nobody picked up. 
And Donna says maybe they'll pick up now. Charlie asked if someone called today, and Donna said they called the office. Then Erica called Donna. Charlie said he's looking into it right now, and Donna said, I think it's your work, but I wanted to verify the number. Charlie says, let me call someone and says, trust me when I say I wouldn't worry at all. Donna says, okay, she just wanted to let him know. Charlie says, I'll tell you why. Especially because, what do you call it? Especially because you know who it is. So let me call someone and take care of it now, okay? Donna says she loves him, she thanks him, and that's the end of that call. Immediately after he talks to Donna, who does he call? He calls Katie. But her voicemail picks up. He leaves a voicemail and says, hey, it's me, it's important, call me, bye. So Katie returns the call. Katie asked what happened, and Charlie said someone called his dad's office today looking for him. They said they dropped some paperwork to them, and there was a phone number on there, and that person left a message with Erica. So Erica calls his mom and says, normally I wouldn't call you, but I had a strange phone call. Katie asked for the number they're calling from, and he says he can ask Erica, but the guy's name is Sammy. Katie says somebody's pulling your bones. Charlie says, well, this is the third. And then Katie interrupts and says to call the number because she's about to call. Charlie says someone wants to be called back. And he asks if she still has that number. Katie says, well, obviously on that number, nobody's picking up. It's a non-working number like a Gmail number. Charlie says nobody's pulling his leg. He says that he's asking her to find out who the F this is. She tells him to get the number off the caller ID at the office, and he says this is a BS game. Charlie says they're not coming out on foot. They're not writing letters, not calling the office because they have nothing better to do. Katie says, I don't know what to tell you because I called that number myself. Charlie says, okay, let's just call that number and find out what the heck's going on. Katie said she tried another number and left a message. Katie says that she's trying to get whoever's threatening their family, but if they don't pick up, what the heck? Charlie says, I understand they called this morning and they're waiting on a phone call. And since it's three times, so Katie interrupts and says, get the number. Charlie says, Okay, so he gives it to her. Charlie says that he understands they called this morning and they're waiting on a phone call. She says she has it. She said, that's it. That's a non-working number. Charlie asks if she can find out. And Katie says, then it's like, what? I don't understand. If I learn somebody's pulling your bones, somebody's harassing you or trying to get something out of you. And Charlie says, find out because the other phone call is going to be the FBI, I'm telling you. And when they catch the person, they're going to be asking lots of questions about who Katie is. Katie says, we've already spoke about this and it's not even a joke anymore. Charlie says, it's not a effing joke, Katie. It's not. Katie said, someone is harassing you and harassing and using my name. You think I like that? Charlie tells her to think it through, find out who it is. And he says, that's all he's asking. Dude, you call the number. Katie said, she's going to call straight from her cell phone because of some BS and somebody's going to pinpoint some BS. She said, this is getting aggravating. Charlie says it is, and he tells her to find out who it is and stop playing games. He said, I don't know who you have to talk to, but it needs to be nipped in the bud before. And then Katie interrupts and says, no, but I am going to handle this myself. And then she just goes on a F this, F that rant. But the stress in these calls is really becoming evident. You, these calls are not good enough or clear enough really to put on the audio version, But you can definitely seek those out. I'm planning to put all the wiretaps in chronological order on my channel at some point. Charlie says to find out, and Katie says, that's threats. I'm about to go to the FBI. She says she's getting irate with this, and either the FBI is playing games or whoever it is is playing games. Charlie says no. Katie says she's getting mad, and Charlie just says to find out. Katie says they gave a wrong number. She says to text the number to her. She doesn't care about the code BS and says she's going to call the cops. Charlie says either you go to the cops or we go to the cops to find out. Katie says they can both go. Charlie says whoever this is knows you and your family. Charlie says they know him and his family. And Katie says that scares her that somebody is saying her name out loud. Charlie says don't mess. And then he says, well, if they're messing with you, they're messing with me. They go back and forth with Charlie telling her to find out who it is. They F this, F that. And he says he has to get back to a patient and he tells her to call the number. Katie says, you don't listen. I called it. It's not a working number. And then she says she's going to mess up whoever it is. Charlie said he's going to call his mom and have her call the office. Katie says, get the number. It's either someone who's playing games, tapping into stuff, or just trying to aggravate someone and I'm aggravated. Charlie says to do him a favor and try the number he gave her the other day, and he'll have his mom call Erica. That call ends. But what you notice on that call 
is they're starting to fight with each other or just get irritated because Charlie's just sort of desperate to find out what's at the other end of this line. Of course, the undercover is not picking up for Katie or Sigfredo. They're wanting to talk to Donna or Charlie. And Charlie, you can tell, doesn't want to call. He's having her do it, encouraging her to do it. At this point, he hasn't said he's going to call. Charlie calls Donna and asks if Erica has caller ID at the office. And Donna says, yes, but there's no caller ID with this call. Charlie asks if there's a way to look up what number called. And he says, I thought we had that caller ID in the office. Donna says they did, but it stopped working. Back to Katie and Charlie, and it gets a little heated in this conversation even more than it did in that first call. His voice has just a much more serious tone. Charlie tells Katie there's no caller ID at the office, so he tells her to call the number he gave her the other day. He knows it wasn't a working number, but he says, call the effing number. Katie asks, you want me to call from my phone? Charlie says he could care less where she calls from. Katie says, oh my God, bro. Charlie says, I don't give a F. And Katie says she's called and it's not a working number. I mean, she's mad. And she tells him, you go ahead and find a phone and you call it. She says, for all you know, somebody's listening to everything. Charlie says, there's nothing to listen to, whatever conversation they want. He says he'll call from the office and then from there, he'll call the FBI. The call ends. Nine days after the initial bump with Donna, Charlie finally calls and gets the person on the phone. This is on April 28th of 2016. The agent answers and Charlie says, who is this? The agent says, who is this? And Charlie says, someone's been calling my family and he's trying to figure out who it is. The man posing as Sammy asks, in reference to what? Charlie said, somebody named Sammy called. And the agent said, yeah, that's me, man. Charlie says, what's going on? The agent says, well, what's going on is my brother Tato has not been taken care of. His family has not been taken care of. The agent then switches gears and says, why are you calling me? Who are you? I gave this number to a lady. Charlie says, I don't know who Tato is. And the agent says, you know, Katie and Tuto, they've been taken care of since the family's problem has been taken care of up north. Charlie says, I don't know who you are. And the agent says, you don't? Charlie says, no. The agent says, well, this isn't going away, my friend, because let me tell you something. I was at Broward with Tato and he told me the whole story. Nobody's taking care of him or his family. The family was taking care of Katie and Tuto, so we know what's going on. And Tato needs to be taken care of. Do the right thing. The lady already has the paperwork and she knows what I'm talking about. We know Katie. We know Tuto. We know they've been taken care of. Charlie says, all right, let me look into things. And the agent says, no more effing around, man. This ain't going away. Tato, you guys need to do the right thing for Tato. That's my brother, man. That's my brother. And he needs to be taken care of. His family needs to be taken care of, just like Katie and Tuto have been taken care of. Charlie says, all right, I've never met these people, but let me call you back. Sammy calls him out and says, that's BS, man. You know this lady. I don't know your relationship with the lady, but we all know what the F is going on. It's not going away. Take care of Tato, just like you take care of Katie and Tuto, man. Charlie says, let me call you back. That was the end of that call. So Charlie calls Katie. He asks if she can give him two minutes, and he said he called the number. He said it rang like 30 times and then somebody picked up and it sounded like, you know who this is? And I said, I'm returning a call. He asked what this was in reference to. And he said, the guy who called his office this morning was Simon. And Charlie said, so I said someone by the name of Simon. Charlie says, I go, what's this about? And he's like, who are you? I go, that's not important. It's not important who I am. I said, what can I do to help you out? Charlie got a case of the diabetes because he did not say that, y'all. And he said, like, listen, man, Tuto or whatever his name is, someone did a really big favor for you and was there for you. And I'm Tuto's brother. I was with him in Broward. Charlie says, I don't know if this guy's from Broward or whatever, and he hasn't been taken care of. His family hasn't been taken care of, and he's like, it's BS. Charlie says, I'm letting him talk, and I'm hearing a bit of a New York accent. When he picked up the phone, he didn't sound like a tough guy, but as the call went on, the tough guy was coming out. So he was like, listen, I know you guys took care of and you're taking care of Katie and Tuto and their family. Now, Tato needs to be taken care of. I was with him in Broward and he's done a big favor for you. Charlie says, I go, sir, I don't know. No money has been given. I don't know who these people are and I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, who are you? And I'm like, listen, that's not important. He says he isn't going away. You better do the right thing. 
Charlie repeats himself about this. Charlie says, I don't know if this guy they're talking about was incarcerated in Broward, but they reference Katie and Tuto. Katie says, they're saying my name again? Charlie says, your name and some guy's name I don't know. And saying your family is being helped out. I mean, other than the hours I give you at the office on the weekends to take care of things, he says, I do help you out, but you earn the money on the weekend when you go up. Katie asked Charlie about the phone ringing for a long time. And Charlie says, I don't help. I don't just give charity out. Like you come in my office. He didn't threaten me at all. He just said, this isn't going away and to do the right thing. It sounds like a cop that's fishing or an investigator playing some games, but He's coming up with a lot of details. Katie asks for a recap again of the conversation. Charlie gives her one, and Katie notes when the agent said that this was in reference to, he's using educated words. Charlie wonders if he should go to the FBI and kind of play phone tap. They discuss if this is some random person, and he mentions a homeless person who Googled his name, and then they know where you live. Katie says she will call the number, and Charlie says he isn't paying anything. He says, do you know what kind of vacation I can get with that money? Then he says he needs a vacation. They say their goodbyes, and then they hang up. Sigfredo and Katie. Katie tells Sigfredo she has more information for him that there was a call made this morning back to back. She said someone named Simon contacted the office, and they're threatening and very close to reporting it already. She says she's getting mad because her name is involved, and then Charlie gets mad. Then Katie says it gets better. She said she tried to call the number and it's not a working number. So she tells Sigfredo about the call she had with Charlie and also the call that Charlie had with the undercover. She says to Sigfredo that the undercover said his name and he's like, wait, what? Katie says, yeah, they said our name. For all I know, it could be another Katie. Sigfredo asked if she got the number and he says, you keep giving me the wrong number. He recites it, and then he just says to text him the number. In another call, Sigfredo says he needs to get a phone again. He was going to call from his phone and dump it, and he may call from his office. Katie says, call it from somewhere else or block it, but don't call from your office. Sigfredo says finding a pay phone is impossible. Katie said to use a friend's phone, and he says, okay. So that call ends. Sigfredo calls back and asks if she's sure that's the number, and she says yes. He said he got an answering machine. And then he tells her what the answering machine said, which is, I'm busy, call me back. Katie calls Charlie, and they're panicky. Katie says that she called the number, and now there's an answering machine with one of the names that he said. She says she just doesn't understand. Charlie asks what the voicemail says, and she says she's at work and she can't talk. He said that she should try to call again later. And she said it's weird, though, because they picked up for him. He says maybe she can find out or he'll just wait a couple of days and call back. He said the person wasn't talking tough at first, but started talking more tough as the call progressed. He also said he could hear that New York accent. Katie said she's going to call from someone else's phone because she uses the phone she's on for work. Charlie says maybe this person will want to meet up and talk to them about their specific issue or as specific. And then Katie interrupts and says they're going to have an issue you don't do throwing out names and threatening people. Charlie says they're saying, my family is helping a Katie and her family and some other guy I've never met. Katie says this makes no sense. And Charlie says, yeah. I was like, it's none of your business. <laughs> and in hindsight, I should have said, this is a big family. I have a lot of cousins. So somebody in the Adelson family owes someone money. Charlie says, give me a name. And then I'll go to that person and say, who did you not pay? They keep throwing out that the Adelson family is helping Katie and some guy. And this guy needs your help, and it's not right. He said, it's effed up that you're not helping. Katie says, well, that's a threat right there. Charlie says, it's like me calling someone and saying, I know you killed JFK. Pay me, okay? Katie says, that's the wrong example. She says, what does that have to do with anything? I don't get it. You're always using examples. Charlie says, my point is I had nothing to do with any of this craziness. I want to know who in my family owes someone money because I'm going to go to that person and say, what's going on? My mom and dad don't know who these people are. Charlie says, I'll go talk to whoever it is. If it's my brother, I'll turn on him and get the reward money. He goes on to say, my brother is a piece of crap. You know, the one that's up in New York making a living for himself and not being very Adelson. But moving on, Katie says that he's a family member. Is he a family member? Or that they were incarcerated. Charlie says that Sammy says he's that guy Tuto's brother or whatever. 
He told me exactly what happened when I was up with him in Broward. Katie said, people could just be Googling stuff. Charlie says, the only reason I'm going to bother calling you is because they want to keep talking about you. I'm going to feel horrible if it's the wrong person, but you're harassing my family and I want it to stop. You meet someone face-to-face on the street, you call their office, the next call is to the FBI. He says he doesn't want anyone to go to jail because people get mad and they feel they have to get someone back. He said that's why he didn't report whoever stole his jet ski. He said that's grand theft, but he doesn't want to put someone in jail who knows where he lives. So in another call from Katie to Charlie, she says she's called the number three times and the first time she left a message in Spanish. She says the voicemail says, puto, I'm busy. She said that means fool in Spanish. She also said it could mean the B word. She said she left a voicemail asking, who the F is this? You need to call me and quit threatening my family. She said she'll keep trying to call. She said what's running through her head is somebody is trying to be like an informant or something. Charlie says he thinks the same thing too. Or somebody's reading the newspaper and playing games. Charlie said that they didn't say Katie's last name and says it could have been another Katie and Tato. Oh boy. He says they need to stop. And Katie said it's making her mad and they need to pick up the phone. She said, basically, he said, you're messing with my family and if you don't stop, we're going to have a problem. So whoever it is, they're going to have a problem with us no matter what. Charlie says, they're going to have a problem with me too. He says, you come up to my mom on the street, send letters to their house and call my dad's office leaving messages. That's three times. Katie said her friend was livid, her friend meaning Sufredo, and that she asked her friend, could you do me this favor because I'm not a guy and I don't know if it's me that they're talking about. And he's like, that's messed up. Then he said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Charlie says, well, I feel better. I definitely feel better. He apologizes for not going somewhere. He said he got a Hallmark card and traffic sucks. Katie says she's taking Zumba classes and she's on edge. She wants to punch somebody in the face so bad. She said she feels bad for Harvey and Donna because she cares for them. Katie talks about Sigfredo saying it's going to be handled. And then Charlie says, oh, there's a voicemail now? Katie says no matter what way it ends, it's not going to be good for whoever is messing around. Touche, Katie. Charlie says the last thing he wants is somebody who's trying to extort money going to jail and sitting in jail because of him, just sitting and thinking. He says, just leave us alone. He said he's not looking to send anybody to jail, but it's going to happen if this guy keeps doing that. He said the police will get involved and he'll get in trouble. Charlie repeats the part about telling him a name of who it is in the family and brings up his older brother, Robert, again. He says, Katie, I've got a huge family. I've got cousins. Katie says, I've got to get in here. My kids are like sponges. They can hear everything and I'm very upset. Charlie asks if she wants to meet up with him or does she want him to just leave it for her to pick up tomorrow? Katie says she wants to meet up, but if they can't, she'll call when she gets out. Charlie says, okay, he was going to work out and for her to call him. Katie is talking to one of her kids, telling them to hold their sister's hand and don't ever let her walk by herself. Charlie says, let me know if you want to meet or if she'll pick that up tomorrow. She says she'll call him and says that it's an hour drive for her. So they say their goodbyes. The next call we have is from Donna to Charlie. And Donna sounds a little stressed on this call to me. Charlie asks what's going on. He says he's working out. Donna asks if he's alone at his place, and he says yes. She asks, what happened this afternoon, and was it anything, you think? Charlie says no, and Donna says okay. Charlie says he'd rather not talk to her on the phone. She asks where he's going to be tomorrow. Charlie says Pembroke Pines. Donna says they have an eye doctor appointment at 1045 in the morning. Then they have to come back to pick up the kids and then they'll go back up to Fort Lauderdale. She said she thought there was a chance she would be able to see Charlie, but she says, we'll see. She said it sounds like he's busy working. Charlie says it's nothing big. And Donna says, let's talk tomorrow. She says maybe they can come to where he is either on their way down or on their way back. She says to text her an address. Charlie says he'll be at Pembroke Hospital And he says there's no parking, so he would have to come downstairs. Donna says, oh, yeah, I remember. Charlie says he gets yelled at if he stops working for 10 minutes in an office. He said they yell, they get annoyed with him, and then they go tell the doctor. But Donna interrupts and says, it's what you thought originally, that it's what you told me. I'm assuming here she's talking about Charlie's theory, this is the police and not really somebody associated with knowing what's going on. Charlie says, yeah, I'm 99% sure that's what it is, and I'll tell you why. One reason is this person's too well-spoken. Donna says, yeah, the language. Charlie says, there's no threats. And he said he made it clear, I don't know who these people are. And the person seems surprised. 
He was like, really? I go, yeah, I don't know who these people are that you're talking about. So we took the route of you got to take care of so-and-so and you're taking care of this family. And I say, I'm not taking care of anyone. And he left it with me. Do the right thing. That's not language when someone says, do the right thing. And I'm going to tell you something. Think about a high school fight or threat. I'm going to kick your butt after school. It's just that simple. When your dog poops on the carpet, you say, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to beat his butt. He said he talks that way about one of the boys. I'm like, you need to smack his butt. That way he hears the threat. You know what's missing? Never once was there a threat, even if you don't mean it. That's the first thing you say to someone. Do you notice not one time has there been a threat, even an implied threat? And it makes complete sense given a couple of things. The timeline. Donna says, "Uh uh-huh, that's what I thought too. Charlie says, two years later? He says, listen, if I had any information, I would talk. I would help you out. I don't have anything. I would be beyond shocked if the family doesn't hire their own private investigators. But really, what are they going to do? They're not going to be able to knock on a door and go, hey, did you do this? Just thought I'd stop by and ask. They have to come up with a plan that's going to stir the pot. So if there's something going on, But then what are they looking to achieve? What are they looking to get out of doing this nonsense? If it's money, I'll be shocked. Because the way you collect money is to go to someone and tell them you're going to do this to them, and then you give them 48 hours. You tell them where to meet somebody, who's going to drop it off, and if there's any nonsense, X, Y, and Z is going to happen to you. That's it. And if you get one of us, you can't get all of us but someone else will take you out. It's done with such precision and being ruthless. You know what I'm saying? It squeezes somebody and they don't have a choice to think straight, so they give you the money. Like even if you're innocent, it's like someone saying, I'm going to the board of dentistry tomorrow unless you walk back in your office and write me that check. Or I'm writing the board of dentistry when I get home, filing my complaint, and I will sue you tomorrow. It puts you on the fence real quick. Charlie asked Donna if she remembers the lady whose mom wanted a refund. He said, I was refunding what she spent. And she goes, I want money for everything. I told her we already agreed. I would give you the money for whatever failed. And she goes, I want the money for absolutely everything. I've already spoken to my attorney. There'll be a lawsuit filed and a board complaint filed before the end of the week if I'm not able to pick up that check. Do you understand? Charlie says, and listen, the work was fine half the work. What do you think I did? I wrote the check. I'm thinking to myself, these people aren't looking for a check. What do they want you to do? What's the one thing they want? Donna says, I know what they want, but they're barking up the wrong tree. It's not us. Charlie says, I got it, but they don't know what. What's the one thing they want? Everyone to start talking. They want you to hand deliver yourself because they think you know something. If they were to come to you tomorrow and say, Donna, come down to the police station with us. We need to talk to you. You'd be like, I don't need this aggravation. Give me your business card. If I can help you or if I hear of anything, I absolutely will, right? Donna says, right, but if you go ahead and make it seem like you're being extorted and blackmailed or something crazy like that, then what are you going to do? You're going to run down there and start talking yourself. Donna says, I guess that's very clever of them if that's the deal. Charlie says, this isn't someone who started doing this yesterday. This isn't somebody who's dumb. This is somebody who's super smart. And a lot of times, This is what goes on, but it's real odd. It's a year. The amount of time this passed is insane. So here, this is that little slip up because he's referencing the time since Dan's been shot. But if Charlie has no idea what's going on, how would he know what this is in reference to? He said it would be like having a dental office and being like, you know what? I didn't get paid on that case four years ago. Let me turn them over to collection. It's four years ago. How do you not realize you weren't paid on a big case you did four years ago? None of it makes sense. Donna says, and you're getting played for it. Charlie says, without a doubt. Do you know what the lack of threats means? I mean, soon you'll be effed. What does that mean? Someone's going to write a bad review on Google tomorrow? It's like they're almost afraid to say they'll break your leg because they'll cross lines they themselves can't cross. Donna says, I just hope they don't go and bother Wendy. Charlie says, if they do, they've bothered us enough. If they bother any more, they're not far from going to the police. Look. Wendy will go to the police. Donna said, yep, that's right. And when I spoke to dad, he said, we don't say anything because the last thing we want to do is aggravate Wendy. She's been through enough. Charlie says he doesn't want to scare her. He says she was scared from day one and she's finally over being scared. Donna says, and if she heard this, she would be beside herself. Charlie says, you know what the thing to this is? 
everyone handles situations differently. It's like somebody has a death in the family and if they don't act devastated and everything else, well, does it mean they're responsible for it? No. Or like confrontation. It's like fight or flight. Some people are confrontational. Some people are like, have a nice day. Some turn their backs, walk away and ignore you. Donna says, but that was what my original feeling was, was to go to the police. But dad said, we've got to protect Wendy. She'll be devastated. Charlie says, I don't want Wendy to get stressed and then worry about her safety. And Donna says, exactly right. That's why we'll keep it from her. I just don't want her to be upset. And hopefully this will just stop. Charlie says he called Katie and said to her, listen, you're the only Katie. I know other Katies, but I've known you a long time. I don't know if they're referencing you. And if I'm wrong, I feel horrible. They're trying to bring you into this. But she said she had somebody call and the voicemail wasn't set up before. And then she called a couple of times and she blocked that number. She had a friend leave a voicemail for that person. I think she had a guy call. I think the guy wasn't happy and he let the person know it on the voicemail and basically told them, you need to stop running your mouth or you're going to have a very big problem and ask that person to give them a call. That's the message I got this afternoon. The voicemail is in Spanish. So the person spoke to them in Spanish and basically told the person what they've got coming to them and a call back if they needed to have a little word with them. He tells Donna the same thing. When I spoke to the person, they had a New York accent and he said the person that he spoke to, it was the same voice on the voicemail. So he thinks it's just somebody playing games and fishing. He said it's the same guy and the person is doing an awful bad job of hiding who they are. Charlie repeats this whole thing. If somebody wants to, they'll just wear a disguise so people can't see who they are if they're really serious. He said the fact that there are no threats and they're using devices that can easily be traced and the fact they said to me, do the right thing. The person wasn't angry. They were calm. I was real nice to them. And I said, listen, the truth is I'm trying to find out what's going on. What's this about? I think it's a bunch of nonsense. I don't want to scare Wendy. If they do approach her at that point, just go to the police. Donna says, go to the police and that's it. Okay. Then she says, let me let you work out. Donna's just done with this conversation. Charlie says, I thought you'd find that interesting. Do you find that interesting or not really? Donna says, oh yeah. Charlie again, mom, trust me. Someone telling you to do the right thing. That's like saying, come on, help me out. If they are who they say they are and they don't appeal to your good nature and say, come on, help me out. They want to get a dialogue going. I told him, we don't help nobody. Prosecutor Kappelman at the end of this call points out this is the first time he uses Katie's name to Donna. And there's no mention that this Katie is the one who's been extorting them for the last two years. Because if you watch Charlie's trial, and if you haven't, spoiler alert, Charlie's defense is Katie was extorting him. That she had talked about the million dollar offer to propose to Dan to let the boys move to Miami. And so these hitmen took it upon themselves to go commit the murder. And then just cross your fingers, the layaway plan works and that you get paid. It's the dumbest defense ever, y'all. So that's it for today. So I hope you guys have a good rest of your evening. We will see you soon. Mm -hmm.